Morning, church. How's everybody doing this morning? I'm excited this week because it is Thanksgiving weekend and uh, my wife gets off work and I get to spend time with my family and we're going to eat, eat until we uh, fall out on Thursday. <laughs> uh, I love Thanksgiving because uh, we spare no expense on Thanksgiving. We cook everything, uh, every dish, every favorite dish that we love, but we get a chance to be with family. And so I am grateful to be back with you, Discovery. Uh, I love your pastor, Tim, and his wife, Audra. Uh, they're good friends of ours. I was actually met him um, when, he was came, when he came down on a vision tour, uh, even before this church uh, was birthed, this vision was birthed out. Uh, we were friends, and so we go way back. Uh, pastor Tim is a great leader, and uh, we're grateful for his partnership in the Florida Baptist Convention. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Patrick. I'm, I serve with the Florida Baptist Convention in the East Region, and so I just uh, come beside pastors and churches uh, just to help out in any way that I can. I did not come here alone. I came here with my bride of 30 years, love of my life, Archelina. Come on, y'all clap it up for her. She keeps me grounded, and, uh, and she loves me well. And we have uh, three adult children. I thought that one day you can be an empty nester. In fact, I was dreaming of it, but I now realize that never happens. So <laughs> I digress, but I'm still thankful. Uh, if, you, if you have your smart device, you're going to want to turn to Matthew 15, 29 through 39, and just mark that in your book. This is a great um, passage of Scripture. But before we get there, um, Matthew 15, verse 29. Before we get there, I want to share with you a, a story that I love in the Bible. And oftentimes when I read the Bible stories, there's, there's some stuff that happens that I have questions. I have questions as to why this happened. It doesn't make sense. But there's a story in Acts 3 about a man who was lame from birth. And the subheading to this pericope, this passage of scripture, is the man lame from birth at the beautiful gate. So the story goes that there's a man who was lame from birth, and for 30, over 30 years, they brought the man to the beautiful gates of the church to beg for money. And I got questions because for 30 years they brought the man and they brought him in front of the beautiful gate, but nobody ever thought to bring him inside the church. Until one day, Peter and John came by and they saw this man who would come every week. They would bring him to the beautiful gates in front of the church and they thought that they were helping him by giving him money, but they didn't think to help him to bring him inside to gather more than he could ever need, to fix him, to make him whole completely. Not so with Peter and John. They stopped and saw this man, and they, after all of these years, can you imagine, 30 years, these two guys who came saw the same thing. They knew something was off. And so they asked the man the question, do you want help? And the man, thinking that they were going to give him money, said yes. And he said, they said, silver and gold we don't have. We don't have any money. But we have something greater that can help you wholly. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And the Bible says, this man believed and got up and he leaped. And what a testimony. Everybody who saw this man for 30 years, they knew he was lame from birth. They saw this man now healed. Amen. And it was because two people one day stopped and they had compassion. That's our theme this morning, compassion. And I would like to share this morning from the title, Making a Difference. And I want to share with us that you don't know how the little that you can do can make a big impact on someone's life for Christ. 
What this simply means is people with a heart like Jesus, they make a difference. One of the most misleading things about being a Christian is that I can live my life and not be concerned about others. I can go about my business and not care about others when in fact, it is our responsibility as, as believers in Jesus Christ to be concerned about others. In fact, the New Testament is filled with teachings on love one another, all of the another passage, on another passage. And so that's what a minister is. A minister is one who ministers to others, who serves others, who is, who is concerned for the well-being of others. Too often, church, we hide behind what I call the spiritual professionals, the pastors, the leaders. And we say to ourselves, it's, it's their job to care. It's their, it's their job to have when we're all called to help somebody out. It's true that God has called pastors and leaders to have care and compassion, but he's called every one of us to be engaged and to make a difference in this world. And I don't know about you, but I believe that what is missing in our world today is people who look and act like Jesus. And so here's what we must remember is that compassion is a core attribute of those who have been touched by Jesus. In fact, it is a hallmark of who we are because we know where we were and we know that it was Jesus that brought us out of that. And so it compels us to act so that somebody else can experience this grace that we have found in Jesus Christ. Amen? Look with me again in, in, in Matthew 15. Moving on from here to there, Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee. He went up on the mountain and sat there, and large crowds came to him, including the lame, the blind, the crippled, and those who were unable to speak, the mute, and many others. They put them at his feet, and he healed them. So the crowd was amazed when they saw those who were Speaking now, those who crippled were restored, the lame walking and the blind seeing. And watch this. When we do something in Jesus' name and God shows up and acts on our behalf, he gets the glory. Everybody knows that there's a God when he sees God work through our lives. Then... Jesus called his disciples and he says, I have compassion on the crowd because they have already stayed with me for three days and have nothing to eat. I don't want to send them away hungry. Otherwise, they might collapse on the way. The disciples said to him, where could we get enough bread in this place to feed such a crowd? Now, there's always somebody in the church that's a skeptic. There's always somebody in our circle that doesn't believe that wants to zap our zeal, that wants to bring us down. I don't know about you, but I believe the passage that says, with man, nothing is possible, but with God, all things are possible. And so I'm going to keep believing until God says no. I'm going to keep betting on the power and capacity of God until he says no. Well, <coughs> disciples question and Jesus asked them how many loaves are there after commanding the crowd to sit on the ground he took the seven loaves and fish and gave thanks and broke them and he gave them to the disciples and they gave it to the crowds and verse 37 says they all ate and were satisfied in fact they collected leftover pieces seven large baskets full now there were 4,000 men who had eaten besides the women and children. After dismissing the crowd, Jesus got on into the boat and went to Magadan. Would you bow with me as we pray? Dear God, we thank you. Because you're so mighty, you're so strong, you're so good. God, we thank you because you are the God of compassion. You're the God that acts on our behalf even when we don't deserve it. You're the God that love us despite of our failures and fall. 
God, I pray right now that you block out any distractions. Help us to lock in on what you're trying to teach us this morning so that we leave out of here better than we came in. We love you, O oh God, because you're so merciful and your grace is so broad that it touches all of us. We love you. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Making a difference. Here in the text, Jesus is teaching his disciples another lesson on compassion, how to make a difference in this world, how to impact the world with the love and the witness of Jesus Christ. And I submit to you that you can't, you can't even get to the gospel message without compassion. Because people need to see the sermon of your life. They need to see the sermon in your life and how you act and how you love and how you touch them before they can even hear you. And so here are a few, I want to give you four observations from this section of scripture that teaches about the ministry of compassion that we all would be wise to learn. First, we see in verse 29 that Jesus went. The first thing we see is he stepped out of the box. He stepped out of the bubble. And here we see the feet of Jesus. Verse 29 begins with the simple profound statement. It says, Jesus went. He went from here to there and walked beside the Sea of Galilee. And this was not a geographical move, but a, a lesson for us in ministry. Jesus did not stay in the comfort of his last miracle or rest in, the, in, the, in, the, in his prior success. Sometimes, sometimes we have a difficult patch, a difficult season, and we call out to God. And once God delivers us and brings us out, we go into spiritual retirement. And we act like it wasn't God, that we weren't broken, that we weren't in need, that we weren't the ones that needed help. Not so. Jesus went. He pursued. He pursued lost people. He pursued brokenness. And that's what he called us to do. He continually sought opportunities to meet the needs of people. And so in this first observation, we learned that as a minister of the gospel, we must first be willing to go. We must step out of our comfort zones and go where people are hurting, broken, and in need of the gospel. Ministry doesn't always happen in the safety and comfort of the church building, in our holy huddles, or even in our homes. It happens when we step outside of our holy huddle, when we step outside of the bubble, and we go to where people are hurting, and we simply love them like Jesus loves them. And so the question this morning is, are you willing to make a difference by going where Jesus calls you to go? Even when you're going, that place is uncomfortable or inconvenient. Well, the second thing we see is in verse 30 and 31, not only did Jesus, does it say Jesus went, but when he went, he also called. He called out the broken. He called out. He served. He didn't just, he didn't just go and look. He called out. He didn't do like those people in Acts 3 for 30 years brought this man to get temporary help. He gave them something that will help them for life. And I want you to know that if you ain't got nothing else, if you got Jesus, you have all that you would ever need. Yeah. Here we see the heart of Jesus in verse 30 and 31. It said, we see the heart of Jesus. He, as the crowds are bringing their lame and their blame, they're, they're blind, they're lame, they're crippled, and they're mute. He didn't turn them away. He called them to himself. And that's what I love about the God we serve. It doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't how matter how broken or far you have turned away from God. If you're willing to come, Jesus is, he has his arms open eyed and he's ready to receive you and bring you in. Notice the type of people that came to him, the broken, the marginalized, the needy. Jesus didn't limit his ministry to the religious elite or the socially acceptable. His heart was for those who are hurting. What would our world look like if the Christians had a heart for those who were hurting? Jesus didn't limit himself. I submit to you that when I pastored, there was a, there was a teachable moment in our church. We had a church plant 
that launched 13 years ago. And, and we had a young, young visitor come in, and he had his baseball cap on. And I could see it when I was up preaching. The, the, de the deacon had looked as though there was a stranger that came in. He was looking and eyeing him and eyeing him. And he was waiting and waiting. And when the young boy sat down, he said, I got him. Went over, rushed over, tapped him on the shoulder and said, hey, you got to take your hat off in the building. We don't wear hats in the church. And so the young guy got up and left. And I'm watching this while I'm preaching. And it broke my heart because we don't know why this young man came. We don't know what was going on in his life. Church, I want you to know the church is a hospital. We, we come here to get healed and we come here to get hope. David said, I was glad when they said, come let us go to the house of the Lord. And so that deacon was so focused on religion and rules that he failed to see that there was some, someone who was broken and in need of love. He was in the right place at the right time. It did, didn't have our, our uniform on and that disturbed him. And he sent him away. God forbid us if we sent away somebody who came to the right place to be touched by the master, Jesus Christ. I just submit to you that sometimes we care more about comfort than testimony. Sometimes we're more concerned about our holy club than his kingdom. Sometimes we're more concerned about convenience than brokenness. Here's what I want you to know. Discover the world needs a church that sees people as people and not people as projects. I had a chance to go over to the Middle East to meet some of our IMB missionaries. And here's what they said. They, here's what they want our churches to know. They said that, that, that the hearts are so hostile and hard towards the gospel over there that it may take, it may, it takes five to seven years before you can even get into a gospel conversation. And here's what they said. They said churches that, churches that come over to help, you know what they come to do? They want to come and do a quick project so that they can come back to the States and brag about, hey, we painted a house in the middle of Africa. But can you go and can you serve when you can't celebrate a story? That's what compassion looks like. I submit to you, as ministers of gospel, we're called to serve the broken, those who are hurting, and we should never overlook or dismiss anyone who is in need of our help. Our ministry should reflect the heart of Christ, a heart that is open to all people from all backgrounds, from every position in life, regardless of their status or condition. So the question here is, do we have eyes to see the broken around us? We've got churches on every street corner almost. And yet, America is getting more and more dark, more and more lost. There's something wrong with that church. That means that those of us who have been left around to plant the gospel are not stopping and staring. And so are you willing to serve with the same love and compassion that Jesus showed us? Well, Jesus went out and then he called out the, the broken but the third observation here is Jesus was willing. I love this part here. Jesus was willing. That, that should be encouragement to someone today. You came in here and you're in a rough patch. Don't you know, it's, it's just good to know that Jesus is willing. He's willing to help us. He's willing to bless me even when I'm not deserving. It doesn't matter about my behavior. God is still willing to save me and set me free. Jesus is willing. This demonstrates his greatest attribute of love. I love Romans 5 and 8, which simply said, God demonstrates his love towards us in that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, you know in our society, we love to throw around, I love you, I love you. And we say it, but we don't really, we don't act on it. I'm so glad that God didn't just say he loved us. He acted in love by sending his only begotten son that whosoever believe him should not perish but have everlasting life. 
Well, verse 32, Jesus was willing, provides us a beautiful glimpse into the heart of Jesus. Here's what he says. He says, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now for three days and do not have anything to eat. And I'm willing, I'm willing. God is willing. Somebody here needs to know that today. You can't fix yourself, but just know that God is willing. If you take one step with him, he'll do the rest. Would you be willing because God is willing? He says, I'm willing, I'm unwilling to send away hungry lest they faint. And here's, here's, here's the lesson here. When some of us are confronted, confronted with a, a moment, an opportunity to help, most of us, as we're honest today, we feel bad, but we don't act. And that's not Jesus. He didn't just feel bad. That's what compassion is. is it's not just feeling bad about a condition or a situation. It's doing something about it. Jesus' compassion moved him into action. He wasn't content to preach and heal. He also cared about their physical needs. And that's the essence of true compassion. It isn't just feeling bad. It's acting in love. And so that's what the ministry of compassion is. It's the mission of Jesus. It's the ultimate expression of love on the cross. When we think about what Jesus did, the greatest act of compassion, in that moment in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he looked toward the cross, shame, I believe that he looked in the future and he thought about you and I. And he asked if there be any other way to pass this bitter cup, but he was compassionate. He said, nevertheless, I know this is the only way. Not my will, but thy will. And he hung on a tree and he died so that you, you and I can have a right to be reconciled back to God. Now, I'm going to be honest with you this morning. If I can be real, I get it. Like, people's lives are messy. It's, it's messy business. And there, there are some people that have, they're dealing with some, some heavy stuff. But here's what I know. True ministry requires a willingness to get involved even in the messiness of people's lives, just like Jesus did. I said earlier that for some reason, um, I, I, I tell my wife that I feel like I got a sign on my chest or on my forehead because oftentimes I just be in a random place and someone would come up to me and they just unload the clip. <laughs> you know how when you, when you come in in the morning, if you're not a morning person, you say good morning, but it's kind of rhetorical. <laughs> and that old happy, happy person that already had, they're on their second cup of coffee, they, they come in and they start doing all that talking and the frustration. <laughs> well, for me, sometimes I just have people that come up to me and they just dump. And I have to guard my heart and see that God is presenting me an opportunity to love somebody and to help somebody, to encourage somebody and to strengthen somebody. And the question this morning here is, are you willing to let compassion lead us into action, to, to step into the messiness of people's lives with the light and the hope of Jesus Christ? Someone needs to know today that you've got the answers that somebody needs to their problem. And so here's what I know when, when we're moved with compassion like Jesus is teaching us today, we can make a difference. Well, Jesus was willing. He acted. Well, in this fourth observation, we see that when we, when we, when we act, when we decide that we're not going to just walk on the other side, we're going to do something. In verse 37 and 39, it says that the people were satisfied. Encountering Jesus satisfies us both physically and spiritually. Look at us. So the conclusion of this passage is powerful. Jesus takes the little. Here's the second, like, miracle of the loaves and the, and, and the fish, right? He, he takes the seven loaves and a few fish. He takes the little that people had, and he multiplies it. And that's a word for somebody today that all 
Jesus is asking for you is to bring your little. You, don't, you can't fix yourself. You can't pull yourself together. All you've got to do is decide in your mind, I, if I can just get to Jesus. That's why I love the story about the woman who, who had the issue of blood. For years and years, she was in this condition. She tried uh, uh, many doctors. She tried to get help in many places. But she told herself, if I can just get to Jesus, and if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I know that I can be, be made whole. And so that's the powerful thing. If we can just bring our little to Jesus, Jesus takes our little and he makes it much. What's remarkable here is not just a miracle of provision, but the satisfaction that the people experience. Church, when we get engaged into our context, into our communities, into our lives, we make a difference and people become satisfied with the knowledge and the hope of Jesus Christ. When we encounter Jesus, he doesn't just give us enough to give by. He satisfies us completely, wholly, both physically and spiritually. And so what we must remember is that Jesus is the one who satisfies. Amen. Our role is not to fix anything, but just to bring people to the one who can. The source, the true source of satisfaction. And so whether people come with physical needs, emotional wounds, spiritual hun hunger, whatever it is, Jesus can meet their needs. So the question is, do we trust Jesus to provide for or satisfy the needs of those we are called to serve, those we are called to touch, to bring light and hope to? When I think about that question, I reminded a dear friend of mine, his name is Ken Weathersby, and he asked me a question one day. Older guy just pointing to a young preacher. He says, he says, Pat, what? What's worse than being lost? I was like, man, that's, that's a deep question. I struggled to answer, and he helped me out. He says, Pat, you know what's worse than being lost? Being lost and no one's trying to find you. That's what hopeless looks like, hopelessness looks like. And so how do we respond to knowing that there are millions and millions of lost people, thousands even in our community, that we can bring light and hope to. But it takes our compassion. And so my question this morning to you is, what, what causes you to get, get up in the morning? Is it an alarm clock? What's your reason why? I, I believe, I believe when I think about the resurrected Savior right before he ascended to heaven, I believe God wanted us to know, take our minds off heaven because he left us here on earth to be an extension of Jesus, right? You remember in that Acts 1, the, the disciples were ready. Persecution was on the way. And they said, it's now the time, Jesus. It's now the time for you to establish your kingdom. And he said, nope. They longed to be with, us, with him. They wanted him to take, him, take them with him to zap them into heaven. And he says, I'm leaving you here because you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in your home, in Judea, in your community and contacts, in Samaria, in places that are inconvenient and uncomfortable. And you know what? There's no place on the planet that you're not going to let your light so shine so that people can know that I exist and experience the hope and love of Jesus. And then he ascended. They kept watching. And, and the Bible says in Acts 1.11 that the angel tapped him on the shoulder and said, why stand you here gazing? It's time for you to now go. And so I believe that if heaven was the goal, Jesus has the power once we believe in faith to zap us up and take us home. But he doesn't do that, right? He leaves us here so that the world can know that there is a man who came 
became flesh like, on a, like us, took on this flesh body, gave up his life, took our sins and shame, everything past, present, and future, put it on his shoulder, died on a tree. Satan thought he had won the battle, but in three days, he got up from the grave with all power in his hands. And so we know how the story ends. It doesn't matter how dark this world ends, how bad it gets. We know that it's a fixed fight. At some point, we're going to open our eyes and we're going to see Jesus and we're going to be with God in eternity. I want to close with this story. There is a story about a young boy who stood on a beautiful beachside. And on this beach, there were starfish, thousands of them that, that had washed ashore. And this little boy saw all the starfish on the beach, thousands of them, and he began going and grabbing them, picking them up and throwing them in the water, picking them up and throwing them in the water. And a man saw the boy and was like, this is weird. And he asked him the question, why are you doing this? There are thousands of stars on the beach side. You can't possibly make a difference. And the boy paused and he held up one starfish. And here's what he told the old man. It takes, it makes a difference to this one. And he tossed that one in the water. What a great picture of the power of compassion. Like this boy on the beach, each act of love, each opportunity acted on, each service we can offer one person to make a difference in someone's life. That's what the message is. Jesus demonstrated in Matthew 15, 29 through 39 that compassion his compassion not only heals the broken, but it satisfies the hungry. And you know what? When you just act and you are used by God to help someone see Jesus, it is the greatest feeling in the world. It is addictive. You get the I can't help us and you want to tell any and everybody about somebody who can save anybody. And so the question this morning is who is the one person you can touch with the love of Christ. Will you be moved with compassion? Will you decide that you're going to make a difference? I want to close if you would bow with me this morning. As we lean into Thanksgiving, the Bible says here, when it talks about the miracle of the 4,000, seven loaves and fish, it says that God took the little that they had. And I know some of us are waiting on something in order to do something. And I'm, not, I'm telling you, that's not how faith works. God wants you to act expecting that he's going to do the impossible. If you take one step, he's going to carry you through. God took the little, Jesus raised it to the Father and he gave thanks. As we lean into Thanksgiving, will you decide that I'm going to move from this society that is so indoctrinated with complaint and worry and I'm going to take my blinders off and see Jesus and give thanks for the little that I have. Here's the call today. If you don't know Jesus for the pardon of your sin, today is the day to say, yes, Lord. God, I'm putting down my shame and sorrow. I believe that you died for my sins and I want to be free today. Jesus, would you please save me? If that's you today, I invite you to come. If you're here today and you came in with some stuff, that has got you weighed down and you're ready to throw in a towel, give up. 
or you're just heavy. It's more than you can bear. God's not telling you to fix it. He's telling you to bring the little that you have. Can you just for say, God, I'm going to put down my brokenness and my pain, and I'm coming giving you expecting that you, amen, even if you don't fix it, you'll be with me in the middle of this pain. I'm coming today as a declaration, a signal to you that I'm ready to be freed of this. If you're sitting here today and this message was for you, you haven't done all that you can. God's been presenting you opportunities and you've been looking the other way. Would you pray today that God would put a passion and burden in your heart to see people differently and extend your hand so that they can see and know the hope of Jesus. Would you stand with us all over this place as we get ready to worship? Dear Father God, thank you. Thank you for these moments in scripture. You taught us the lessons that you are a God of compassion. That you are a God of hope. That you're a savior that saves. And that you're a God that uses us. May we not take that lightly. But may we lean in to the opportunities that you called us to serve. Help us to not be like the parable of the ten lepers who came and you had mercy and compassion over them and you healed them. And they all went away. Nine took their healing and never came back. But there was one who couldn't live with himself. He came back just to say thank you. May we be the one in light of what you've done for us at Calvary's cross that comes back and says, God, if you don't do anything else, we thank you for what you've already done. We love you, O oh God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We're going to worship. The altar is open. Would you come? Would you come?